my name is Mark Hinkle. There was originally another gentleman named Tom from Brocade that was supposed to be here to give the SDN talk. Uh, I'm not going to be able to give that talk in, and do it justice, but what I did was I talked to the people at Open Daylight. I got their latest briefing deck, and I was somewhat prepared to give a short talk on SDN, and then I'm going to do the Cloud 2.0 um, talk that uh, Todd announced earlier today. So if you guys were here for a long SDN talk and you want to go see something else, you're not going to hurt my feelings. That URL that's up there now, SlideShare slash socialized software, has the up the date, has a 30 slide deck on open daylight with some updates and the latest release. I'm going to go over at a very high level. Um, I am not steeped in SDN and open daylight in the way that I'd like to be to give the talk. So um, sorry for those of you that were hoping to get SDN, but we're going to talk about cloud. We're going to talk about networking as well. So this is, the, this is what's uploaded to SlideShare. Um, my name is Mark Hinkle. I work at Citrix. I, work in their, I run their open source business office. So Citrix uh, has initiatives. Um, and Open Daylight, uh, Cloud, Apache Cloud Stack, Zen Server, etc. Tom was supposed to give the talk. He's sick. You're stuck with me. Um, these are the slides, as I said earlier. Um, uh, we'll touch a little bit on that. We'll also talk about SDN today. So, SDN. The reason that it's interesting is it's the level of abstraction around networking. So if you look at servers and storage, we've had abstractions for a long time. Um, in the networking world, we've been more physically bound, um, probably with the exception of something like OpenD switch, which is a software switch that allows you to, to um, <clears throat> bridge across hosts. And the reason that people are interested in it is it allows the same amount of automation. It provides a platform for you to automate things and have dynamic networks in the same way that you have dynamic cloud infrastructure for compute and storage today. Um, as you can tell, I'm more on the server side than I'm on the network side, so that's why I make those analogies. Um, <clears throat> but basically, in a nutshell, what you're doing is you're, with SDN is um, <clears throat> separating the control plane and the data plane, giving you the ability to interact via an API and do interesting things with networking. <clears throat> so, this is sort of, sort of a, a simple um, abst abstraction of the network. It shows the application layer, your control layer. You interact with them and allow you to control <clears throat> the data plane going through these different devices. One of the things that you probably will run into when you talk about um, software-defined networking is OpenFlow. It's an open um, standard, sort of developed at Stanford, I believe. Um, <clears throat> giving you the ability to control your uh, network devices remotely. Got Open vSwitch. Open vSwitch is a, um, <clears throat> a switch that allows you to, that really became popular because you had these virtualized servers and all of a sudden you had multiple uh, virtual machines that were bridging across servers. It gives you um, software switching across the servers. Um, and you could Google that. I really am not going to do this justice if I go into too much detail. What Open Daylight is, is it's an industry consortium. And it's an industry consortium that is uh, located in the Linux Foundation. The Linux Foundation brought all these different um, organizations together to create a common controller so that we can instrument our networks to the control plane consistently and not have to duplicate efforts. And it's pretty much a who's who of the uh, networking industry. Uh, a lot of the original code came from places like Cisco and IBM. So that's just in a nutshell. If I go through here, um, here's sort of the industry leaders, the uh, Brocade, Cisco, Citrix, Ericsson, HP, Intel, Red Hat. You can read the logos just as well as I. But, but the idea is that in open source, you want to you want to commoditize something that adds little incremental value. You want to develop things that don't exist and add value further up the stack. It's sort of like the Linux kernel. Everybody in the industry here around Linux is collaborating on the kernel, 
and then they work on things like management, signing the binaries, et cetera, to, to add value up the stack. So that was my horrible five seconds on SDN. Um, this is something I do know a lot about and I have a lot of opinions on. And it's really, and SDN factors into this. I mean, I think uh, VMware has done a good, if you read any of their stuff on the software defined data center, does a good idea of talking about how, how the data center should look and where, what it's becoming, what it's evolving to. Um, software defined networking is one part of that. Virtualization and, and virtualized storage, et cetera, is part of that. And it's enabled even further by things like containers and microservices and open source software. So I already told you who I am. These slides are on SlideShare. So I've been doing this cloud stuff since about 2006, 2007, when um, Amazon uh, first launched DC2. Uh, I worked in virtualization before that. And uh, the, the place where I spent most of my time around cloud was, I was at a company called cloud.com and we developed something called Apache Cloud Stack. So I spent a lot of time personally on Apache Cloud Stack, but I kept looking at all the competitors and what everybody else was doing and having envy of things that Amazon was doing because they did an awesome job of defining cloud. Um, but this is sort of what I talked about back in the day, 2012. I talked about public cloud, stuff running in, your, in their data center. I talked about private cloud, stuff um, running in our data centers. And then I talked about hybrid cloud, stuff moving back and forth. Now there used to be a joke at that time about hybrid cloud. Hybrid cloud was like sex in high school. Everybody's talking about it, nobody's doing it. To this day, I sort of feel like that's the way it is. I think workloads exist in different places but I don't see people massively moving workloads back and forth from Amazon to their OpenStack or their vCloud or their Apache Cloud Stack or whatever. I feel like they manage clouds across different locations. This is sort of how things evolved. Back in the early, early days, conceptually, I think the people that talked about SOA were talking about the, the, where we were going, but there was a lack of tools and enablement for them to do uh, service-oriented architecture uh, holistically the way we can do things today. Basically, it was coming, things were developed in our own data center by single product vendors, et cetera. Then in about 2006, and I forgot my glasses, so if I make up dates, just nod and laugh. 2006, Amazon launched EC2, um, and things started to change. Google uh, launched App Engine, and all of a sudden, we started to see the beginnings of public cloud. So 2010, you started to see uh, open source cloud vendors like Apache Cloud.com at the time, Apache Cloud Stack Now, Eucalyptus, um, OpenStack, starting to gain traction and interest because people said, hey, this Amazon's really cool. I don't know if I want my stuff in their data center, so I want to do it in my data center. Then 2013, we started to see an interesting uh, tool set evolve around containers. Containers aren't a new idea. Um, containers are something that you've seen in Solaris. Uh, uh, you know, there's other implementations of containers other than Docker, but how many people here have heard of Docker? Yeah. You go to a tech conference today, it's Docker, 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 Docker. And for good reason, it's an interesting and important technology. Then last year, we uh, saw uh, Pivotal release Cloud Foundry um, as a industry-wide platform as a service. I think that's interesting because that's an abstraction for um, application level deployment, PaaS, or as Josh McKenty said yesterday, pizza as a service, um, which is an interesting analogy. And then finally, this year, you start to see other things like Google releasing Kubernetes into its own foundation to become an industry-wide effort. How many people here have heard of Kubernetes? Okay, Kubernetes is an orchestrator that, that orchestrates containers, allows containers to be scheduled sort of like Amazon schedules virtual machines in EC2. So here's the thing that's different from 1995 to now. 
we're in this era of what I call cloud abundance. Back in the, the day, IBM, IBM's great because they have the ability and the resources to think 20 years ahead. So they said, yeah, this SOA thing, that's the way it's going to be. You know, a lot of the terminology and the um, <clears throat> design patterns of SOA are being implemented today in uh, design and microservices and the way that we think about cloud. Unfortunately, when they had that vision, there wasn't a um, abundance of cloud tools, cloud um, <clears throat> uh, services, cloud software allowed you to do that, or even clouds. Um, so that's what's different. And just to my point about cloud growth and abundance, this is where we're at today. You just, just a hockey stick, 20% um, year over year growth in services consumed in cloud, not to mention the stuff that we're doing in our own data center that we don't manage. So, so this is how I'm gonna set up today. I'm gonna talk about where we started and how it's evolving and where we're going. So cloud 1.0, um, and I sort of made reference to this earlier that, that back in 2010, a lot of companies were trying to emulate what Amazon was doing in the cloud. Call them copy copycat clouds. I don't mean that to be pejorative. I just mean that they were trying to emulate Amazon within their own data centers, present company included. Uh, I worked very hard to try and emulate Amazon APIs. Unfortunately, Amazon was a $100 billion company with ama amazing resources, and they were going towards one target of a hosted cloud versus me trying to run it on uh, data centers, along with Eucalyptus, which has since been bought by HP, and uh, <clears throat> HP Cloud Compute, which at the time was OpenStack. Now that's known as Helion. And back in those days, we said, yes, we're going to do Amazon, but we're also going to do our own cloud. And there's a really good, smart guy, his, um, his name's Adrian Cockcroft, who built the cloud at Netflix. And Netflix, and he used to uh, liken this to room and riding. So you're trying to keep yourself on the Amazon cloud for certain stuff. You're trying to keep yourself on um, your private cloud, whether at that time, if it was Eucalyptus or VMware's vCloud or whatever it was, it was really difficult. He said, you know what Netflix strategy is? It's all going to Amazon, because then we only have one cloud to manage. And what they did was they, they used Amazon to grow their business. So Netflix, the way they grew across the world is if Amazon had a data center there, they would enter a geography. If Amazon didn't have a data center there, they didn't enter the geography. And they, their, they started an open source program, and their open source program wasn't to recreate the same things that Amazon was doing. It was to create tools to make them more effective at using Amazon. So that's a good strategy of, of developing what didn't exist and innovating there commoditizing everything. Amazon commoditized the cloud for them. If they wanted to get in, go into Bulgaria and Bulgaria had a um, data center, it looked the same way it did in the United States and Great Britain and everywhere else. So there was a very marginal cost to them going into a new geography. And that's what helped propel them to be the cloud juggernaut, juggernaut that they are today. And during this time, we, we, all, we really talked about cloud with very specific labels. You have a public cloud. Do you have a private cloud? Do you have a hybrid cloud? And <clears throat> what we did was, was say, oh, it, it had to fit these um, parameters. And we have a public crowd, cloud strategy. We have a private cloud strategy. At the time, it sort of made sense. Not so much today. Um, we're getting to a place where it's just cloud. Talk a little bit about that. So. Now we're sort of in that end of what I call cloud 1.5 era. And this is what happened. This is I'm going to attribute to, uh, this is Simon Wardley's uh, graph of cloud adoption in the enterprise. Um, and I work for an enterprise vendor. I work for a startup. And we go talk to the enterprise people and we say, what do you think about cloud? And they're like, eh, it's just for these Facebook kids. Eh, it's just for the Twitter kids. Eh, it's just for the eBay's and the PayPal's, it's not really for us. Then all of a sudden, in the last couple years, every enterprise um, CIO that I talk to, they're like, yeah, number one priority is cloud strategy. I'm like, yeah, 
playing catch up because it is a real thing and it has real benefits and it's stable and secure and valuable to many, many more enterprises other than Twitter, Facebook, et cetera. The other thing that's happened in this 1.5 era is abundance of cloud tools. So how many people here use Puppet, Chef, Salt Stack, or Ansible? Okay. How many people have used them for more than five years? Okay. Puppet, you could have. All the other, um, Salt Stack, Ansible, et cetera, they're, they're new. The HashiCorp tools like um, Vagrant for development environments and Packer for image packaging, um, those things are all relatively new. But these are good tools. These are actually tools that are of as good a caliber or better than things that IBM management would have sold you in the past or BMC would have sold you in the past or CA. And they're innovative because they, they move at a high speed and they're informed by the users that are actually using them. That's one of the big benefits of open source that I think people overlook is I work for a commercial company and we have professional engineers who write great code. The problem is they aren't solving their own problems, they're solving other people's problems. So they lack context. Users, on the other hand, usually are solving a problem that affects them very personally. They have great context. Also in open source, a lot of time users do not write the best code. So what you're trying to do is provide a way for the context to come from the users and the engineers who are, are good at writing code to help them um, streamline that code and it's a good product. That's why open source is interesting and effective in my opinion. So now you have these tools. So I talked about the configuration management and the automation tools. We have things from Bitnami is like a packaging tool for uh, cloud images. Red Hat has their Manage IQ. Vault is a HashiCorp tool that allows you to share secrets across clouds. Um, really, Mitchell Hashimoto, who started HashiCorp, is just brilliant. All his tools seem to like take off like wildfire, and he's got a good, good eye for what those problems were and turning them into products and then open sourcing them to allow people to, to tell them how to make them better. The other thing that changed is so we had these, we had tools and we had people that are interested in it and all of a sudden you started to see a change in culture. So how many people here know what Dev, have heard of DevOps? How many would say they work at a place where DevOps practices are used? Cool. That's good. So um, the guy in the center, that's Patrick Dubois, he's the godfather of DevOps. He's the guy that coined it. Um, he's a system administrator that um, lives in uh, Belgium, out in the country. And Patrick started talking about how the culture around how you um, manage IT and develop IT is just as important as the technology that you use. Um, then Gene Kim, uh, anybody here read The Phoenix Project? Okay. Phoenix Project is, was one of the best-selling books uh, the last two years um, in management. And w the thing that's interesting is he took the idea of DevOps and applied it to a fictional company and showed how DevOps practices helped or lack of DevOps communication um, hurt a business's productivity. And then you get Netflix. I think Netflix is just the great poster child of how, you know, the man, it's a manifestation of how DevOps works. You know, the developers and the operations people talk together. They have, you know, um, shared responsibility for keep getting things to production and keeping it up. They have good communication. They iterate fast. Um, they, have, they have process, but that process isn't onerous. And it, there's a, it's sort of a blameless thing. That's one of the things I really like about DevOps is um, one of my friends used to run Amazon's uh, um, web, the front end, all the web properties. His name was Jesse Robbins. He used to be the CEO at um, Chef um, or Ops Code at the time when he was there. And they talked about how they do their, um, their post-mortems. And it's a blameless, you know, why did this go bad? And, you know, how should, it, how should we do it so we don't get bad? It wasn't Bob messed this up. It's, you know... 
we checked out the wrong code or we didn't run unit tests against stuff or whatever it is. Um, the other thing that they did was they, they, they do things like, um, and Netflix, it's a Netflix uh, um, tool called Chaos, Chaos Monkey. I worked for the first international ISP back in the 90s. And if you would have told me that we're going to just randomly t turn stuff off and see how that works to test our, our uh, um, resiliency, uh, I would have fired you. Um, at Amazon and Netflix, they run uh, Chaos Monkey across their infrastructure, which causes chaos, turns things on and off, reroutes things. And the idea is that that's how they test the resiliency in their, in their systems. Um, it's, you know, it's ballsy, to tell you the truth, but um, they also have incredible uptime and run at incredible scale. So this 1.5 era, I think, shakes out like this. When we talk about public cloud now, I think you're talking about three companies. I think you're talking about Amazon, Google, and Microsoft. And the reason I say that is because I think they have the massive scale, the elasticity, the footprint that makes them truly cloudy. They are a public utility, just like electricity. And they're, they have this global footprint. They are extremely, extremely um, <clears throat> uh, fast at the way they bring products to market. It's, it's amazing. And that's where they're strong. Uh, stability, security, and privacy. And actually, I would say in the last couple, I've given this talk through the last year, I would say stability is less and less of a concern. But you know, you used to get like the head of the IT news when Amazon had an outage would be like Amazon outage and EC2 East, blah, 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 blah. You don't see that like you once did. Security is a perceived problem with public cloud. I think it's more of the fact that there's a big attack face there and that lack of control and lack of process around security. I think the tools are getting better and better there. And the third one is privacy. And if you live in the United States and you put your data on a network, privacy should be probably a concern for all of us. Then, then we have what I call the managed cloud. And these are people like Verizon, Terramark, VT, CenturyLink, people that have clouds, but they also own their pipes. I think that's really important. The, the net neutrality, um, legislation that has gone to Congress numerous times over the last year is important because if, at some point where you're paying for a different class of service, um, it's going to affect the way your cloud works. The thing about a managed cloud is you can also buy the pipes to your cloud. So that, that, that gives you an advantage if that's a, if that's a um, consideration for you. Um, you also see different security and, and SLAs. So you've got people like Verizon and uh, BT and CenturyLink also give you um, different SLAs than, than Amazon, usually a, a higher level or a finer grain. So I think that's, that's a differentiating factor. And then there's this third class, which I call the SP cloud. So I call this um, <clears throat> these uh, SPSI clouds, so they have system, um, systems they sell, they have system integrators that help um, implement the cloud, they customize these clouds to meet your specific needs, so I look, them the, look at them as having a lot of the benefits of a private cloud, but with the added benefit of their expertise, and in the case of HP, you can also get the hardware, you can get the networking, you get the storage, you can get you know, yada, 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 and software and IBM, same kind of thing. So those three classifications are the 1.5 cloud. Here's the other thing that happened, and probably uh, the catalyst for taking us to cloud 2.0 is containers. So I didn't say Docker, but it's Docker. And it's Rocket, which is from CoreOS. You guys, how many people here know CoreOS? Okay, cool. So the thing that's interesting is in the early days, we abstracted the operating system, um, <clears throat> the hardware through virtualization. So you had VMware, you had Zen, you had later on, you had KVM. Now we're going up the stack into user space and we're abstracting the application layer in uh, largely using Docker. Um, and this isn't a new concept. Um, They've, they've had abstractions for at this layer and since Laris for a long time. 
A uh, company called Joyent uh, uses the Illuminos kernel. They use containers. Um, and actually, from a pure technology implementation standpoint, they're pretty impressive. Um, but they're not as popular. And sometimes the, you know, it's the VHS versus the Betamax argument. Sometimes the most popular trumps the best technology. And I'm not saying that's the case here, but um, popularity helps. It's also um, proven that this kind of infrastructure works by people like Google. So the other day, in, uh, Brandon Phillips gave the keynote, and he talked about Giphy. Um, it's basically Google infrastructure envy. Um, Google runs everything on containers, and their Borg is, is containers run by a, you know, Kubernetes, but highly specialized for Google. But it gives you units of resource isolation, it gives you portability, um, <clears throat> and it gives you model tenancy without heavyweight VMs, so you don't have to emulate as much. So you theoretically have a lighter footprint, and it should be um, scale better on your hardware. Everybody's going Docker, 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 containers, containers, containers. And it really is the flux capacitor. It makes, it makes, time, it makes cloud computing possible for cloud 2.0. Um, and, and Docker is, is a really interesting company and everybody wants to work with them and they're adding some interesting things like provenance. They tell you where your, your container ran in the past and where um, to give you sort of an audit trail, sort of speaking to that security issue. Um, they give you version control and uh, allow you to have your own repos with Docker. That's sort of their business model. So interesting stuff. It's, it's enabling Cloud 2.0, which I'm getting to. So at the end of this whole like era that we're in now in this beginning of Cloud 2.0, I think there's some interesting things going on. We have virtualization from KVM, Zen, and now containers, virtualizing the operating system, the app, and the hardware. We have distributed storage. Uh, I could go really deep into storage, but uh, um, anybody here, Ceph user, Gluster user, interested, open, interesting open source distributed storage. Uh, anybody here, OpenStack users? So, Ceph file system with OpenStack storage seems to be a pretty popular combination. I believe there's a big building across the street that's invested heavily in doing that. Um, then we have networking. Early on here, we talked about open daylight. I think that having storage, compute, and networking virtualization is the key for us to get to cloud.0, 2.0. Got it in spades for com com compute and storage. Open Daylight and some other initiatives are, are starting to make it a, a reality. Because what you want to be able to do is program your workload to spin up on the cloud of your choice and move from, say, one zone to another. Well, when you move the zones, you want to be able to tell not just the storage and the compute to handle that so that the storage is distributed and your compute, your VMs might migrate, sort of your live migration kind of thing, or probably more likely start and stop or replicate into another data center. And then you got to tie your networks together. And the networks seem to be physically bound until this SDN thing comes along and you start to be able to dynamically do networking. Anybody here use, uh, for you Docker users, you guys use uh, Weave for container networking, allow you to do overlay networking for, for containers. That's, some of these projects are probably gonna be I don't feel like this battle has been won or that's shaken out like the other ones, but it's really important. And the final thing is I think it's gonna run more and more on open hardware. So um, open compute is, a, is an open hardware spec. It's been pioneered by Google and Facebook and eBay and I forget all the other people. But the idea is that rather than have a proprietary hardware spec to run all this, your pizza boxes that you're, you're racking are some kind of open standard. And you, an open compute box that you get from HP would be theoretically, or let's say vendor A and vendor B would be identical, and they could be built to these specs. And you could negotiate with them. And at the end of the day, somebody in Taiwan will probably be 
making them for pennies on the dollar compared to Dell and HP and selling them on Amazon and eBay. But not only is open compute about the server hardware, but there's also open, open networking initiatives and some of the networking that Facebook has pioneered, they've been open sourcing slowly. So where we're going is cloud 2.0. And that's where awesome happens. Before I go too far into just cloud technology, I get, every talk I give I say this, and I'll never stop saying this, but the thing that's really interesting about the technology in open source is, and I'm saying this as someone whose company sells $4 billion worth of proprietary stuff a year, is that open source isn't an open, a zero sum game. That everybody collaborating on things like you know, Docker runtimes and KVM virtualization and distributed storage and open daylight is interesting because at the end of the day, there's certain things in our software that adds very little differentiating value. The Linux kernel is a good example. If everybody, if Red Hat and SUSE and Canonical all had to develop Linux kernels, they couldn't spend their time doing cool stuff like management interfaces and things that add value and pack, packaging the binaries and making sure that they're tested. Um, they've commoditized one layer and worked on innovating up the stack. This is a quote from Allison Randall, who I really like and had a great, <clears throat> great quote about the fact that, that we're not competing solely for limited resources, but we're creating new opportunities for other people. So Cloud 2.0, what we do is we <clears throat> develop what doesn't exist. So my favorite thing, and I don't think it it's, uh, happens as much as it used to, is people would say, this is a really cool proprietary product. Let's make, create an open source version. And um, I think there are a lot of those things now. And so what we're working on is doing cool stuff that doesn't exist in proprietary space. A good example would be Kubernetes and Docker. We leverage the grow, growing base of high quality software. We're leveraging Linux. We're leveraging virtualization. And then we commoditize stuff that doesn't, um, the non-differentiating tech. So people like the, the Cloud Foundry Initiative, they're creating an industry-wide PaaS that everybody can use. Um, and then companies are gonna sell stuff on top of that. Um, I think Hadoop is another really good example. So there's one massively le leader in MapReduce space, and it's Hadoop. And people are offering ways to interact th with that, whether it's Pivotal in their SQL stuff or um, data mining or storage or whatever it is. They're, they're, not, they're commoditizing the stuff that's standard and then adding value up the stack. The other thing about cloud 2.0, remember I had my silos. So we had public cloud, we had private cloud. Now I think what we're doing is we're componentizing things. So you have distributed storage and maybe you're, that storage is being served from um, an OpenStack cloud run by HP. And you may have a monitoring service running from PagerDuty. And you may have an app that you're running that does postal lookups from another vendor, and you have all these, these different <clears throat> components to deliver a product. And there no, some of that stuff may run in your own data center. You may have credit card adjudication that runs through some um, banking system. All these things are components that you're putting together to create a, um, <clears throat> create a product or a service. Um, I hate to use the word service, but it is software as a service. Um, so this componentization is uh, um, interesting. That that's the way they, that they described SOA back in 1995. That's the way we described microservices in 2015, 20 years later. <clears throat> so we have these design patterns where we're using these services that do a single thing. And the thing about the microservices that I, I think is interesting, like, is anybody here deploying a microservice? Anybody here hearing microservice and every, all the press? Pre I don't think there's a great like 
widely, I had a good example on the way over here and I'm getting old and forgetful so I forget what it was but basically if the idea is it does one thing, it does it well. The other thing is uh, Netflix uh, does that in the way they, uh, their infrastructure runs, they create microservices and the way they create them is let's say we have microservice 1.0 and it looks up Know, all the movies with Meg Ryan and all of a sudden they said well microservice 2.0 is going to look up all the movies with Meg Ryan and Tom Hanks so they still let microservice 1 run but they run microservice 2 and to the point where it's deprecated so they may have this this revision of their microservices running until it's you know Meg Ryan Tom Hanks and John Candy and they Whatever, whatever those microservices are, they're all running consistently. So people who are consuming those services may want to go to 2.0, but if it doesn't work, they can back out and go to 1.0. So it's a very dynamic and uh, <clears throat> flexible way to deploy things so that you have the option to try the latest and greatest. But you know, in the old days, if I had a customer-facing service, I'd and this was not very DevOpsy. We'd plan it for months, then we'd have a maintenance window at 12, 12 a.m. Sunday morning. Like, I do not miss those days of sitting there and wondering what we're gonna break, and then sweating it out till Monday morning when all the users come back on, and then you get all these calls and people are just pissed off at you. I used to run tech support for a large company. It happened quite a bit. Now, they can run the microservice, they run their tests again, it's, against it, and if it fails, they can go back to microservice 2.0. Um, 3.0 doesn't work, go to 2.0, et cetera. That's sort of the way they work. At some point, maybe microservice 1.0 is no longer being hit, then you can retire it, but you can let it run forever if you want to, because it doesn't consume a ton of resources. Problem with that is we have a, a service proliferation, and this is uh, an article from the new stack, Alex Williams interviewed uh, Mitchell Hashimoto, who I obviously have a geek crush on and was talking about HashiCorp tools. He said 2015 is the year we start to see a proliferation of these services and um, <clears throat> not just managing them, but the uh, security around them. I call this the zombie problem. Anybody watch The Walking Dead? Somebody's getting chased by the zombie. They run into the house. The best, you know, you know they're gonna die when they run in the house with a lot of windows. Run in the house, they bar the door, and then the zombies come in the windows. That's what happens when you have all these microservices. So, here's how it shakes out then. In my opinion, and I have an opinion, I may not be right, but um, I think I am. Public cloud, we have these three. They're Amazon, Google, Microsoft. They are the utility computing. They are you know, pervasive, huge footprints, massive scale, competitive prices, blah, blah. Um, not a lot of differentiation in the long term. Like right now, I would say Google and Amazon are pretty similar with the exception of Amazon has a ton more microservices like CloudWatch and their tools and things like that. Um, you got Google who, who's just sort of the sleeping giant or just slowly doing their thing and probably will wall up everybody in the long term. And then you got Microsoft, who I think is cloud is very interesting because they are very um, well positioned to help take Windows-based applications to the cloud. Right now, I think Microsoft, or Amazon and Google are really, very much the Linux, Unix-based applications get to the cloud really easily, but Windows, distributed apps, there's not that abundance of tools like there are in the open source tide. Microsoft's changing that very quickly. Then you got private cloud. Here's the thing. Private cloud now I would call the minimum viable cloud. You wanna emulate Amazon to the point that you need to emulate Amazon. You don't want to add all those, math, those you know, tools and microservices and all the things that Amazon has. What you wanna do is create what you need to have in your data center and then consume public cloud services if appropriate and meld them together. Then we have what I call public cloud plus. So you've got hosters like Verizon, like HP, like um, 
IBM, and Salesforce. And Salesforce is a really good example of this. Is, you know, Salesforce bought this company called Heroku back in the day, and Heroku was, it was the Paz. I mean, it was, it was really good. And then what Amazon did was, we're gonna do this platform as a service so people can build applications that level, um, leverage Salesforce. And they did that very, very well. And so that, that's a specific use case. HP will probably create um, a cloud, public cloud with services that are very attractive to their user base. Maybe it does things like um, take advantage of their mercurial testing tool or um, mercury tools or development tools or things like that. Um, Verizon will create clouds probably where, where um, uh, network integrity is very, very important. And IBM will probably come up with something that I can't even think of. So here's where it shakes out. I think what we have is we used to call this hybrid cloud and put everything in silos. Now I just say there's one cloud and it's fabric is made up of different cloud services in your data center, in the public cloud, and they're woven together. And I think this abundance of tools, this um, <clears throat> increased uh, reliability of public clouds, I think an increased, um, probably four years ago, I was at Cloud Connect, and uh, Ann Winbald was uh, one of the cloud VCs, was doing the panel, and they're like, what's the number one thing that, uh, was inhibiting cloud production, uh, cloud use, and, and we uh, unanimously decided that it was um, knowledge. People just didn't know how to interact with clouds. They didn't understand that all these things were API driven. Now I think there's a lot more cloud knowledge than there were four years ago, and there's a lot more people with cloud experience because they played around with Amazon or Google, um, or they've downloaded OpenStack or CloudStack or um, <clears throat> maybe smart OS and played around with it and, and done projects, et cetera. And now I think people are moving faster. So that was my pitch. I'm sorry uh, I went through things pretty fast, skipped over a lot of stuff. The slides are on SlideShare. Uh, I put that URL up earlier. If you just search for my presentation title, it'll come up in Google, I guarantee it. Um, there's also a deck for Open Daylight there. And there's some other decks on cloud computing, open source. Um, with, I try and put a lot of links in my presentations because in 40 minutes I can't do justice to all the things we just copied, but hopefully it's a good pointer and um, you can find stuff in the forums and open source projects out there that support cloud. So um, that's all I had is uh, I can answer a question or two. Sure. Well, with the disclosure that I'm an IBM employee. Yep. Well, because it's PaaS. Okay. So, so, I mean, do you put soft layer, like, like what do you pick? Do you pick I, Blue Mix or soft layer? I put soft layer in earlier. Yeah, I mean, they're both cloud services. So, yep. Yeah. Lack of space, that's the only reason. Or, you know, whatever comes up first in the Google search for IBM Cloud. But I think IBM is, is a really good player in the cloud space. Their soft layers was a really good acquisition, which runs Apache Cloud Stack, by the way, not OpenStack. So, yes? Yeah, they make something called Cloudify, and I think it's uh, used at some significant scale. They're a European, I think. I believe it's platform as a service. I think eBay uses it for, for at some scale. If I, yeah, yeah. No, because Cloudify will run on top of. I know Cloudify fairly well because they they ran on top of CloudStack, and I believe they ran on top of OpenStack. Yeah, yeah, but really more of the applications running on there, and not not all the scheduling like. Anything else? Okay. Thanks a lot. I appreciate your time.